This is the I Read Comic Books Podcast. I am your host, Mike Rappin. Joining me this week, a few Easter eggs you missed in the latest movie based on your favorite franchise, Paul Jaceley. Hey there, humanoids. And Danny. Hello, everyone. Thank you both for joining me this week. We are joined by a very special guest, comic book creator, Kevin Maher. Kevin, thank you so much for joining the show. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, I'm really excited to talk comic books about you. But before we get into all of that, I have two quick announcements. One, did you get your West Michigan Weather Watch shirt yet? Because it's on the store, shop.ircbpodcast.com. Everyone should go buy one. If you're listening to this episode, go there, buy one. It's cheap. It's a fantastic, beautiful shirt. I'm looking at Danny on camera right now. He's got one. It's absolutely amazing. Um, Second, we have an IRCB Discord hangout coming up on April 22nd, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard. Make sure you show up, come hang out, talk tacos, talk comic books, whatever we do. There'll probably be a bit where we, we just go into whatever whoever's there it'll be either nick or paul or brian or kara or me or tia somebody we're going to be talking about a very special interest that is not comic books at least for an hour so get ready to be there be square let's get into things i have two legally mandated questions that i have to ask but i guess before we get into that as well let's talk to kevin for a second kevin how are you welcome to i read comic books could you tell the folks at home a little bit about yourself sure um glad to be here uh my name is kevin maher uh i am have been bopping around the fringes of the comic book industry for the past few years. Um, I finally decided to up and just do my own book. And I work as an art director, a graphic designer, um, and I live in New England. And so I've lived in about three New England states. I'm planning on hopefully moving back to one in the future. So gotcha. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's where I am, and that's what I've been doing. So I, I kind of hope the, the last four years roller coaster will stop uh, soon, so I could settle down. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I guess if you live in all of the states in New England, do you get like some sort of special achievement <laughs> <Yes>. or? Okay. <laughs> <Hope> so. <laughs> okay. It's like an Xbox achievement, right. but in real life that you just get to wear as a pin or something. <laughs> Very cool. Um, well, I have these two legally mandated questions that I have to ask, and that's how have you been? How have comic books been? So before we get back to you, Kevin, I got to ask Paul that. How have you been? How have comic books been? Mike, I've been doing pretty well. Uh, for those who are curious and maybe you want to pick up the shirt, as far as West Michigan weather goes, it has been a beautiful weekend here. We are looking at mid 60s today golden sunshine beautiful blue skies i've been trying to soak up as much vitamin d as possible to uh correct the sort of seasonal affective disorder that you know you know mike from like the end of march into april in michigan is pretty rough so oh yeah so i'm really enjoying the weather trying to get outside you know going for walks usually walking to a bar to go sit and read comics that's usually my thing to do when the weather's nice and i gotta say I've been suffering from, I don't know, comic book fatigue lately. I just feel like every time I go to the shop, pick up my stuff, I'll read my stuff and be like, eh, that was fine. Nothing's really standing out and grabbing my attention, really, until I read a couple books this weekend that really, really tickled me and I want to talk about on the show. One of which was Please. the Unstoppable Doom Patrol number one, new Doom Patrol comics. Of course, I'm on board. Uh, this was written by Dennis Culver with art by Chris Burnham. Um, we have uh, Brian Reber on colors and Pat Brousseau on letters. The world's strangest heroes are back, and I couldn't be happier. The world needs the Doom Patrol now more than ever, I think. And uh, what's <laughs> kind of fun about this is I feel like this book is influenced enough by the recent Doom Patrol TV show on HBO, you know, where it's like they kind of focus on the idea of the team being a family for a, a very dysfunctional family, but a family of people that have nowhere else to go, have very unique problems. Um, and in this issue, we kind of set up a new dynamic for the, the Doom Patrol. We've got Robot Man, Negative Man, of course, Elasta Woman is back. The Chief, who is now one of Jane's personalities. So it's basically Jane as the Chief. And a new member named Beast Girl. And in this issue, they go to Gotham City to track down a, a metahuman. Uh, it's a very, you know, very X-Men Cerebro kind of thing where, like, they they detect a new metahuman and they have to go save it. <laughs> But what's great is like the idea is the team is going because this metahuman doesn't have anywhere else to go. If it ends up, it's not going to end up on the Justice League, right? And it's probably not going to end up, if it ends up anywhere else, it'll be like on the Suicide Squad as a government agent or be experimented on. So the Doom Patrol is there to protect metahumans. And there's this great moment where the chief is talking to Batman because, of course, Batman shows up because they're in Gotham. He's like, no, this is my of city. Course. Like, what are you doing? And the, the right, chief... Right. <laughs> The chief that was a great that, Batman voice. Uh, I've Batman been working voice. on it for 40 years. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, the chief basically says the Doom Patrol has a new mission. We're not letting the system fail another metahuman and no one's going to stop us. And I really like that idea because it's the team dynamic as a family protecting people. And I think that really works for the Doom Patrol. It also helps that Chris Burnham's art is perfect for this kind of book. He can do kind of like cartoony, silly, like humorous art. It's very detailed. 
uh, very action oriented. It's there's these great fight scenes where they're fighting off this sort of evil corporation that's kidnapped this metahuman. Um, and he throws in a couple Easter eggs, of course. And the one Easter egg I did notice right away um, is that Jane turns into a different personality in one panel, and uh, <laughs> Chris Burnham draws that personality to look exactly like Audrey Horn from the pilot episode of Twin Peaks. Like I clocked that like immediately. I was like, oh, that's J- of Audrey course. Horn. So. Um, if you talk about a book that speaks to me, it's throwing in Doom, uh, Twin Peaks references into the Doom Patrol. So yeah, I'm yeah, so yeah. happy it's good. Like, I, again, I love the Doom Patrol. I've talked about it on the show before. Mike and I, we've talked about the Doom Patrol quite a bit on you know the Patreon. So yes, if you haven't checked it out yet, I highly recommend this newish uh, Doom Patrol series. Unstoppable Doom Patrol. Yeah, that's that's super exciting. I, I saw Chris Burnham was attached to this, and all I could think of was just like super duper gritty Chris yeah. Burnham. So it's interesting to hear that that he's mixing his styles across this book because I don't know. All I can think of is the nameless. <laughs> right, exactly. It's not quite that dark, uh, obviously. Yeah, but, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, it's it's if you liked the stuff he was doing with uh, Morrison on the like the second volume of uh, Batman Incorporated, it's very similar mm. to that. Very action oriented, very kinetic. It's perfect. Cool. Very cool. I also want to commend DC for not just plopping Batman on the cover, even because he was going to be on the yeah, issue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like they're letting this be sold on the Doom Patrol alone. But Paul, I have a question for you. Sure. Did you grab a scratch off cover? Oh, I didn't. Oh, oh my I did God. Not. <laughs> but did you, did you love, even scratch it off? I haven't scratched it off. Uh, <laughs> well, love, of course, that, that's going to destroy the value. Wow. Yeah. How are you? <laughs> Uh, I love gimmick covers and and I've seen some online of like the reveals. So they definitely put a lot of different characters behind the scratch off mirror. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess for, for the listeners, it's a it's a cover of Jane looking in a mirror and then you scratch off the mirror like a scratch off ticket. Uh, and then, you know, a different personality could appear. So uh, but I also very enjoyed this very much. I was very happy to see Batman show up because I love Batman. But I was also just really enthralled uh, to see Jane as a chief. That's a really cool change. Uh, and then the new characters, I'm very excited for. The, the internet is loving um, Beast Girl. Yeah. Um, yeah, like the internet's in love with that new character. So um, I'm very happy to see and I'm excited to see where this goes um, in the future. Yeah, it's a cool like uh, it's a cool um, status quo change for the Doom Patrol, something we haven't seen them do before. So it's always exciting. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Kevin, just a heads up. Now, we, now you know you can do scratch off covers whenever you're doing <laughs> cover so work in the 90s. future. That is so 90s. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I never saw a scratch off one before. That's fantastic. Any gimmick, any gimmick cover you throw at it, I will, I will buy one oh, yeah. if it's in my shop. Yeah, they should have put a lottery. Like if you win like ten dollars, like a little scratch off tickets in there too. Mm. <laughs> yeah. You bought this issue, one hundred bucks, great. You know, we're always talking about how how do we fix the comics in, uh, comics industry. Here's the Gambling. thing: now comic shops, <laughs> yes, they can sell lotto tickets next to your comics. This is perfect. This is perfect. Uh, uh before we get too deep into that uh danny how have you been how have comic books been what have you been reading uh mike i've been pretty busy this week uh the first half of my week i was trying to figure out how the mirror knows that the egg is behind the paper oh my god all right uh don't you dare bring tiktok oh trends onto this podcast no. <laughs> <laughs> uh but i'm glad i'm glad people have seen that that, that was yeah. hilarious and then a little aggravating after that but mm-hmm. Uh, I've also been just watching a lot of Star Wars Celebration stuff. They've been oh, yeah. streaming all weekend. Mm. Um, so, funny enough, everything I'm talking about, it's licensed properties today. And okay. mm-hmm. it was not by design at first, but then I kind of leaned into it after two books. So, the sure, first thing sure. I'm going to talk about, Star Wars Hidden Empire. Uh, I finally read issues one through five. This is the conclusion of the Crimson Dawn saga. Everything that's been going on since really War of the Bounty Hunters. And I hope Nick's squirming in the in the production chair right now because oh, yeah, yeah. I'm talking about all this. But uh, this is written by Charles Soule with art by Stephen Cummings, inks by Victor Olasaba, colors by Guru Effects, and letters by Travis Lanham. Um, in this book or in this part of the series, uh, Kira wants to take down the Sith, and she's threatening to unleash a Sith that's been trapped in an ancient artifact, which will disrupt the whole rule of two. Uh, and the stability of the Empire. Uh-huh. And she's using that distraction to try to take down Palpatine and Darth Vader. Um, I love Kira as a character ever since we saw uh, her in Solo. And I'm so glad that she's in the comics. Mm-hmm. So I really wanted to follow along. Um, the only disappointing thing about this book for me, I think it had a satisfying conclusion. But at the end, Marvel did a promo. But it was in Arabish, which is the 
the the writing language in Star Wars. So I pulled out my little app with the Arabish because I think we all have one loaded up in our in our phone. Sure. <laughs> and I translated it, and it just says, "Coming this fall, classified." And I was like, "You made me spend all this time looking for Drink it." Drink your old. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I had a lot of fun. I think Steve Cummings, like he does really, really cool uh, shots of the war. Uh, it's a very action oriented book compared to some of the the previous Star Wars stuff. And and you get to see all the all the little seeds they've been planting throughout the books because I'm not fully caught up on all the Star Wars books, but I know all these characters. They've been appearing in there. So they're all kind of coming together on this Hidden Empire stuff. And like I said, I love Karen. I thought it was a really satisfying conclusion. So I hope more people um, go on to read this uh, later on. Cool. Yeah, I mean, I didn't even know that there was a book about that character coming out. So like, Danny, I'm glad someone's reading it and enjoying it. <laughs> Uh, Kevin, how about you? Welcome to the show again. How have you been? How have comic books been? What have you been reading? Uh, so I've been good. Uh, <laughs> looking to uh, try to relax after the last four years of craziness for me. Uh, mm-hmm. you know? <laughs> um, I've, I've had mo- I've moved, had mo- uh, lost my job, got a new job. You know, it's just been I got married before the pandemic. It's been a crazy, crazy four years. So I finally get to sit down a little bit and actually start reading comics again because I haven't been for a while. So uh, I like, so speaking of licensed properties, I'm a licensed property whore. Uh, I I love (laughs) toys and things like that. So the last book uh, trade I read was uh, He-Man Masters of the Universe, uh, Masters of the Multiverse, sorry. So uh, they recently have been coming, Mattel came out with all these new Masterverse toys and stuff and it got me interested in the comics again. They had the animated show on Netflix. So I picked up this trade um it is quite interesting i i i love the characters so um it's pretty much it's uh it's written by tim seeley and it's got art by uh dan fraga richard friend tom derenick uh colors by matt yaki letters by saida i don't know how to pronounce the name <laughs> tim Ofonte, i think that's how you say it sure. and co- various covers by in lee so it is um it's basically centers on like all these He-Mans from all the different various He-Man worlds. So there's like the movie He-Man in there. There's the animated He-Man in there. There's a little cartoon He-Man jumping around in there. And they have a Skeletor who's the only good Skeletor in the multiverse. And they have to stop <laughs> They have to stop the anti-He-Man who's like an all, they made a toy of this and he's all like black. And so cool. he's trying to go and he, ki- he wants to kill all the He-Mans throughout the universe and be like the only one all powerful. And they enlist the Skeletor to help stop him. So they like to jump around and go in all these different worlds. Uh, my favorite issue uh, part of the trade was they go into the 80s animated universe and they're just they're just ridiculous because they they're like acting like it's the 80s cartoon show and people are sta- oh, sure people are stabbing each other in other panels and they're like oh my <laughs> god what's going on <laughs> you know so uh yeah so i love toy properties and things like that so yeah this was my, one of my favorite trades that i've recently picked up so awesome awesome yeah i knew that dc like was was pushing out more of that he-man stuff i just yeah. like never followed along with it never been like a he-man person but tim seeley i knew was writing it so i'm glad to hear that it was it was fun for folks that like are into he-man that's yeah, that's it was awesome definitely fan, it was a lot of fan service in there it was good for a fan it was great i liked it a lot so awesome that's awesome um well let me let me talk about a book that i've been reading um i guess i have been all over the place i will admit i woke up extra early today so i could go do a pokemon go thing because that's the level of like nerdy that i am in terms of <laughs> doing that type of thing uh, but you know what it's an excuse to go outside and walk around how dare any of you exactly. shame me and laugh about this okay i'm pointing my fingers at all of you and all the listeners at home i'm not ashamed of this uh <laughs> <laughs> I was explaining all of this to Nick last night, which, by the way, Nick bullied me into watching TV show a TV show last night called Jury Duty. If you haven't seen this, um, it's this show where one guy is a real person and everybody else around him is acting, including like it's it's a show about this guy who's on jury duty and the entire court case, all the people that are there, all of the people on the jury with him. They're all actors except for him. It's the funniest show. It's on Freebie, which is like Amazon's free thing. Mm-hmm. So like. You know, your mileage may vary with the ads. I will tell you some of the ads you get are very weird. But Nick and I watched that the first four episodes of that last night. 
It's very, very funny. James Marsden's in it. It's it's absolutely hilarious. Um, and then I went on to explain to him this Pokemon Go thing that I was doing. And I think I talked at him for about 20 minutes about all the ins and outs of Pokemon Go. And I just want to say, like, when I'm not reading comic books, I'm doing that. And it's, it's becoming part of a problem. But um, anyways, I did read some comic books this week. I read Ducks Two Years in the Oil Sands. This is by Kate Beaton. Everybody's probably heard us talk about this, this uh, book to death on the show. So I won't really go too deep into it. But um. Overall, like I was really, really impressed with it. Like Kate Beaton, we know for being like making funny comics on the internet and stuff, and then seeing this book that's about her real life experience when she went to go work in the oil sands in Canada and allowing her to tell this or allowing herself to tell this story about like the harshness of being a woman in an extremely male dominated, isolated area. Um, very scary, very like honest and brutal. And I really appreciated ultimately like the afterword of this book like i think the content of the book is is fantastic I, I will say like content warning there's some sexual harassment and sexual assault that is like a core in of the book um but uh, i think the the thing that i i really wanted to note on with this was the end of this book there's an afterword that beaton wrote about like the harm caused to women who work in overwhelmingly male dominated fields in these very isolated places like the oil sands um but also the damage that the oil drilling has done to the environment in canada and specifically to the first nations people that live in and around those areas um it plays a bit of a moment in the story but overall like kate's experience when she was younger wasn't really focused on that it was just trying to pay off her student loans. That's why she took this job in the oil sands in the first place. And um, I think she's, she talked about how later in life she learned more and more about the harm that these companies were causing to the environment as well as to the people who lived in around it and like give, giving them cancer because of all these things that were leaking into the waters. Um, and yeah, so this is like, I don't know, it's a really, really good book. And I really appreciated that she kind of touched on the things that could have been a part of the story, but weren't because they weren't part of her lived experience. And yeah, over, overall, fantastic. I understand why everyone loves it. It's 400 and something pages, 470 pages or whatever. So like, it'll take you a bit to read, but I promise you it's totally worth it. I can't wait to buy my own huge hardcover copy to put on my shelf because this book is, it's a stupendous feat. And um, yeah, I understand why everyone loves it now. So yeah, definitely recommend it if you're looking to cry a little bit and and read about someone's real experience work because it will it will mess you up, I think. Yeah, it, it, I mean, yeah. I, I read about, I talked about it on the show when I read it uh, a few months yeah. ago and, you know, just very briefly, it's like, it's when I hear other people like talk about it, maybe people that aren't comic book fans have like found it now since it won a bunch of awards in Canada and yeah, it's yeah. celebrated. And like, what I find so interesting about it is like, I had read Kate Beaton's online work with Harka Vagrant, the more comedic yeah. stuff. What's amazing to me is like, her art style did not change at all. Like she draws in the same yeah. style and the same pacing, yeah. and yet it can be very dramatic and serious and real in a way that those Hark of Ignorant comics are sort of goofy and funny. And it's like, it's a really mm -hmm. impressive feat as a cartoonist to not change your style and have a completely different tone to your work. And I've, that's kind of like, when I go back and flip through it, that's what impresses me now when I, when I look at it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But yeah, I guess uh, let's uh, let's talk about another book, Paul. What other <laughs> comics have you been reading? Well, look, <laughs> to, I, we could spend a whole episode about ducks, I'm sure. Uh, we but probably um, should you know. at some point. Yeah, <laughs> and don't get me wrong. I love experimental comics. I love deeply personal comics that push the limits of the medium as much as anybody else. Maybe more than some people, but I also like comics where the Thing and the Hulk are just punching kaiju in the face, and that's what I got when I read <laughs> yep. Clobber in Time what? Number One. <laughs> that's <laughs> sorry for the, the the whiplash here, everybody. <laughs> I, you know, as I said earlier, I was going through some comic p fatigue and I guess what I needed was some kaiju fights with uh, the Hulk and the thing. Cause this book ruled, I, uh, dude, I'm buying this immediately. I, this yeah, is yeah, amazing. Too now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So the yeah. time, uh, written and drawn by Steve, uh, Scochi or, uh, I'm assuming that's how it's pronounced. Sorry, Steve. Um, colors by Brian Valenza and letters by Joe Sabino. Um, it's exactly what the cover suggests. Now, of course, Dan, you'd be proud of me. I got a variant cover. I got the Greg Smallwood variant cover for it and rules it's i so almost great. got that one too yeah <laughs> um and it, it's called it is clobber time it's 32 pages of basically the hulk and the thing fighting giant monsters in alternate dimension there's a story here where uh bruce and ben are hanging out in the baxter building there's a sort of mysterious intruder that they notice and that intruder is like wearing this sort of like welded together version of dr doom and iron man armor and you don't know who it is i'm assuming you'll find out by the end of the miniseries, but that person kind of transports uh, Ben and Bruce to an alternate dimension. There's a group of peaceful sort of creatures there. They're being under siege 
by a bunch of monsters. And of course, you can kind of guess what happens. Like there's one panel where it's kind of funny because like Ben is like the voice of reason in this duo because it's the Hulk, you know, who he's teamed up with. And he's like, it's like, okay, sure. we've got a class four kaiju here. There's a couple of different ways we can deal with it. And the Hulk just jumps up and punches it in the face. And Ben's like, <laughs> oh, okay, that, that works. And then that's what you get. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um scochi's artwork is like that sort of hyper detailed kind of like james stoko uh, if you've read any of stoko's like godzilla books it's very much that kind of vibe cool uh very detailed very fun there's a whole double page spread where it's just like fists and eyeballs and just punching and just smashing and the caption literally says it was a symphony played with fists upon skulls the music of thousands of <laughs> splintering bones and splattering viscera these are the kind of comics I like sometimes. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm assuming there's going to be a much bigger story here. By the end of the issue, they're back in the Baxter building, all battered and bruised up. But we still know who that uh, that sort of intruder was. And then the whole issue is being narrated by a watcher. It's not Uatu. It's a different watcher named Tuvo Tu uh, Tuva Ta. And it's like he's got this giant gun. He's all battle scarred. I'm like, oh, there's must be a story there. So, uh, yeah. Again. <laughs> Sometimes this is exactly the kind of comics you want. And like as a clobbering time, it delivers completely on what the title suggests. Absolute blast. Definitely worth checking out. It's so much fun. <laughs> like I, I, I went into that book expecting only them like, you know, a bunch of punching and stuff. And that's definitely what I got. Yeah. Um, I will say <laughs> the the way that uh, uh, the way that the, the thing is portrayed when it takes battle damage, mm -hmm. like it almost feels like there's muscle behind the rock. Yeah, it's always weird. Like, I think every author has its own interpretation. There's one panel. Sure. I think it might be the promo image for the next issue where it's almost as if the if you slice the thing in multiple little rounds oh and then God. you open it up. It was <laughs> it, it was very weird, but it looks so rad. Like I was all in on the art. I also yeah. love how clueless Reed is about the whole thing, like throughout the whole <laughs> issue, because yeah. he's Reed is doing Reed things, right? He's hang he's in the room, but not really. Right, um, exactly. So, it's very distracted. It's a lot of fun. I, I also, I also recommend it. And there's so many cool variants of it because people love. You can tell these artists love drawing both the Hulk and the thing. Mm -hmm. Like every oh, every sure. cover I saw, it was really hard to pick. This book looks insane. I just, yeah. I'm just looking at the preview. It looks insane. Holy smokes! It's great stuff. Great fun comics. That's kind of what I'm in the mood for right now. So yeah, cool. Uh, Danny, what about you? What else have you been reading? Uh, well, as I mentioned, I'm doing uh, all license all the time. Well, not just for this episode. <laughs> My favorite. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, Marvel just relaunched Planet of the Apes. So I read Planet of the Apes number one, and I only put this on the list because when I put this as my top of the pile, yeah, last week as I as I was in the audience. Mike said we're not talking about it, and I was like, <laughs> the hell we will. <laughs> and now, uh, Nick, uh, mute his mic. Mute his mic. Let's. <laughs> So I wanted to make sure that this book was talked about. Okay. Uh, I'm a big Planet of the Apes fan. Mainly the new stuff. I've only seen the original movie. Like the first one, I, I haven't dove sure. into oh, the I've eight sequels. Seen them all. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's definitely something that it, it's kind of a handful. But this issue is written by David of Walker with art by Dev Watcher. Colors by Brian Valenza and letters by Joe Carmagna. Uh, so yeah, in, in this one, it kind of picks up a little bit the thread from the newer movies. So the ALZ-113 virus has rampaged across the planet Earth and humanity uh, is crumbling. While well-meaning researchers hunt for a cure, a fanatical group of humans, because of course, uh, has their own solution, kill all the apes. <laughs> uh, and, and yeah, so the, the book really focuses on the years after the virus is, is out there. And it kind of hops around a little bit between years. Uh, but that's that's part of what I wanted to see, right? The movies kind of just skipped all that and they glossed over like, you know, we went from what happened uh, to the a like the world was gone and there was mostly apes. But I want to see what happens in between those years. And I think that's what this book is going to focus on uh, if it continues like that. And it also does one thing that I really love. Uh, and this is this goes a lot to Dave Watcher and the art team. Uh, the apes, they look like they have personalities and they... They communicate. Uh, they they communicate through sign language, with uh, sometimes with some humans, but also like they do this thing where like once the humans are gone, like you know when you have like your inner circle and you like don't want to say something to somebody from the outside, so they like have their own little inner circle. It it, it is mm -hmm. so well done because all these apes are now in cages because they're trying to be protected, but are they really? So there's there's so much fun stuff. The really cool setup. 
Uh, and I, I can't wait to see where this one goes. So I'm, I'm excited. I, I love Planet of the Apes. So, Danny, I, I feel like one. I'm very mad at you for having put any lore in my mind about Planet of the Apes <laughs> because I, I've seen the movies. Movies are fun. I, I don't understand why there needs to be lore to this. Like, I just don't. <laughs> like, there's a virus. I don't. What? Why? Why can't we just go like blink of an eye? Now there's apes and it, damn you! Like Charlton Heston just screaming. That's all that we need, right? <laughs> um, I I just don't understand. I just don't. This I can't believe that Marvel's making a comic out of this property. I guess that's the thing that is blowing my mind right now. Um, I, they used to make these comics, right? They, yeah, like, they, they, they were older comics. Ago. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. So it's I guess. nice. Mar- it feels like Marvel's kind of collecting back all their Infinity Stone of licensed properties uh, <laughs> because they they're getting you know they got Star Wars back, they got Aliens back, they got Predator, and now they yeah, have yeah, Planet yeah. of the Apes. Once they get uh, Beavis and so. Butthead back, it's gonna be all over. <laughs> Here, uh, see, but this is like the this is actually bad. I think this is actually bad. I think that all of these properties do not need to live under one house because they are going to fall into the same conundrum that the high Republic is falling into <laughs> where it's just like comics and, and IP for the sake of, we have these licenses and we need to produce them. And is it actually like a good like story that people actually want to read? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to just step off the soapbox before I even stand on it. I just like, <laughs> well, Mike, that's actually a perfect segue to my other comic that I want to okay. talk about. Because this is a Disney property not published at Marvel. Ah, okay. uh, I read Disney Villains right. Scar Number 1 from Dynamite Comics. So I, so it seems like Disney's having their cake and eating it too. Uh, to kind of follow the thread from last episode. Where they get to put out their own comics. But then they also get to license these comics out to other publishers. Mm-hmm. Uh, this one's written by Chuck Brown. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's. I mean, it's Disney. They get to kind of do whatever they want because yeah. no one seems to be able to stop them, right? Right. Yeah. This one's written by Chuck Brown with art by Trevor Fraley. Uh, <laughs> I love the synopsis that they put out. A Tale of Fire and Fury. Uh, because we've all seen The Lion King. <laughs> we know yeah. that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but this this one centers around uh, Scar, uh, who is unable to accept that he will never be king. Um, spoilers if you've seen the movie, I guess. Um, <laughs> spoilers twenty spoilers years later for a thirty year old movie. Yeah, okay, yeah. okay. But uh, the reason I picked this up, other than the really cool dynamite, so good at putting out all these excellent variants, and Scar is one of my favorite villains. Um, and they're actually doing the same series with another one of my favorite Disney villains, Maleficent. Uh, so I'll definitely be talking about that in the future uh, whenever that comes out. But this one is it's a, a story from the point of view of Scar. And it takes place a little bit before all the stuff we see in the movie. It's like all those scenes that Scar's not in the movie. Like, what is he up to? What's he doing? But mm-hmm. the other cool thing is that it gives all these other animals that live in the, the savannah. Like, some of them have motivations f- to put Scar at the top as the king. Because it would benefit them. And I don't think the movie ever touches on that. But this comic, sure. it's expanding on that. And I know you don't want any more lore, Mike. <laughs> but <laughs> Listen, I, I guess Disney's mentality is if it's not documented in some piece of media, did it actually happen? Right. Right? Yeah. This is this is why this is why. All right, we're going to talk about this at the end of the show. We're doing a thing for this week. I'm going to I'm going to rant for about 35 minutes about this at the end of the show. Um, anyways, yeah, sure, it's fine, Danny. Just just put this in my head unwillingly. That's fine. That's that's what I'm here for. I think that's the reason I've been put into this roster just to add, <laughs> add comics that Mike would never even touch never into the, into the list of uh, into the rotation. Uh, but it was a lot of fun. Trevor Fraley really he captures the style of like the animated film without making it look like an animated. Uh, disney movie so it, it's a little bit in between of both things so um i had a lot of fun with this one too i can't wait till the next issue uh and yeah give me more disney villains i think disney has some other like just there's really cool villains we could explore like i would love an Ur- ursula book um like how did she become the the witch of uh, the, sure. the sea um uh, so yeah anything they put out there um i don't normally buy dynamite comics just because they they have a lot of licenses i don't really follow but i'll, I'll mm-hmm. buy these if they put them out. 
and they haven't done a good job of disassociating themselves from Comicscape, but that's a yeah. whole that's other true. other thing. Yeah. Um, anyways, we won't talk about that. Kevin, what else did you read? Let's tell tell us about another licensed product, please. Yes, I will. <laughs> Play the apes. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> uh, so anybody who knows me uh, knows that I am a huge GI Joe fan. I don't oh, cool. buy uh flappies every month anymore i literally just buy trades and discount bin comics a lot gi joe real american hero is the only comic that i've bought a floppy or fo- followed single issue from probably the get-go from like nice. number wow. or whatever in the 1980s uh so i just re- recently read uh it was issue which 298 gi joe real american hero by idw um by larry hama everybody knows who larry hama is i think he's one mm-hmm. of the best writers in comics ever um For sure art by sl gallant uh inks by maria keen colors by jay brown and letters by neil uitake i think mm-hmm. <laughs> sorry if i pronounced that wrong anyway this is so idw's lost the gi joe license um at the end so issue 300 will be the last G.I. Joe comic, real American hero comic of this run. Now, my first ever comic book was G.I. Joe, real American hero number 11 by when it was under Marvel. It was the first Mm -hmm. comic I ever read. Uh, So I've been following this forever. (laughs) Um, That's so cool. So they've already gotten to the 300. I'm like months behind. So so I'm only on part three. So everybody probably is listening to this. If they read G.I. Joe. They probably have already like, oh yeah, this is old news. <laughs> Listen, this this show, if anything, is is solely about us all saying, God, I'm so behind on all of my weekly books. <laughs> right. Don't worry okay. about it. Well, Don't I'm worry behind about it. Years <laughs> on stuff. So sure, sure. <laughs> so this is part three. Uh, Larry Hama is basically doing this big five part send off, and it's cool. basically throwing as many characters in there as possible. Uh, so he's trying to get all the little little Easter eggs, little things. This issue is basically uh, doc. If you know anything about J. Joe, Dr. Mindbender is bringing, he's they, he in the past has brought created Serpentor, which was like a creation of all these great leaders DNA. Well, in this issue, cool. he just brought back Genghis Khan for some reason. <laughs> so wow. it's like a throwback to like the old kind of thing. So, all the G.I. Joes are trying to, uh, they're all on the mission to stop this, what's going on. It's its a big jumble. There's pe- teams everywhere. There's ninjas fighting. They capture a bunch of ninjas. Um, so it's quite ridiculous, uh, which I love. <laughs> and, and, uh, eventually, like Cobra Commander's in there. He's getting upset. He's yelling at old ladies in a casino for some reason. It, it's just, it's just <laughs> as much craziness as you think of. Uh, I, SL Gallant's art is, is good. He does not do a lot of details on figures and stuff. He, it's a lot of, it's very loose, but he does do a lot of details on the vehicles. And I do appreciate that. Like I, they're t- very toy specific. So mm-hmm. I recognize little stickers that he puts on some of the, the toys that he like oh. draws them in on the vehicles in the comics. So that's that's I was cool. like, Oh, that's super cool. So that's like, you know, just Easter eggs for me and other nerds <laughs> um so i have the other two issues i just haven't read them yet and i'm looking forward to the final 300 and then i get to see what company is going to take over the license uh maybe marvel will collect this license back as well who knows <laughs> everything's getting clawed back disney's yeah. just pulling everything well, under the mouse house sells, so they are probably just taking it all back <laughs> exactly but, exactly yeah. I, i'm actually kind of cool. curious kevin um have you read the Transformers versus G.I. Joe series that IDW did a few years ago? Uh, which which one? The by one Tom Scioli. By Tom Scioli, yeah. I yeah, read yeah. the first few issues, and okay. then I lost track of it somewhere along the line, but I used to hate his art when I picked it up. I'm like, this is the worst <laughs> art I've ever seen. And literally in five years, I'm like, this is the best art I've ever seen. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Okay. That, I feel like that is everyone's traversal with Tom Stewart. I love it yeah. now. I can't, I can't get enough of it. Yeah, I want to go back and buy all the trades. Yeah, that's a book we've talked about on the show a lot when it came out. It's I absolutely love it. Yeah. I have no <laughs> emotional connection to either franchise. And I adore that book. So I'm kind of curious yeah. to see what you think of it when you finally yeah. get to it. Yeah, I, I love his work. So yeah, I, I definitely. I mean, 
if you're i don't know if you're it sounds like you might be into this are you into gobots because he also did a gobots miniseries <laughs> I, I have the trade <laughs> okay okay perfect. okay so, i already cool. read it it's already on my shelf <laughs> cool nice. cool 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 uh well let me talk about one more book really quick uh before we get we're, we're going to take a break and then we'll jump into the second half and talk about the top of our pile but i want to talk about one last book that i read recently um this is indigo children number one this is by curtis piers or curtis pyers and rockwell white script by curtis pyers pencils and inks by alex diodo colors by d con if letters by Hassan Otsmani Elhow, somebody at Image made the decision that they should pitch this as Radiant Black meets Department of Truth. And like, I remember when this came out, I was like, cool, that like, I like both of those books enough. Like, I mean, I don't read Radiant Black anymore, but um, I like them enough. I love Department of Truth. So like, let's see what this book is about. And that's the worst description ever, because this book is awesome. And it didn't need that descriptor. Somebody should have just said a London based journal investigative journalist is trying to find a superhero or super powered kid in Russia whose existence has been covered up by a shadow government. Like, that okay. pitch is cool like come on mm -hmm. right everyone loves a good investigative journalist story and quite honestly if you look at just the cover of this book you're going to think it's cool and you look at alex diodo's art you're going to think oh my gosh this is amazing um and quite honestly this book is solid it's page one you're hooked in there's a crazy mystery every single little scene we get a little motif of just bits and pieces as the story's being developed and it's enough that like the hooks just constantly keep getting put into your mind of just like, where's this story going? Where's it going? Where's it going? Until you get to the final end of the page and you still wonder, hold on, this is an ongoing series. Where is this going? There's so many questions that are being asked in this book. And every time you think you're getting a piece of an answer, the story's direction changes and you start to see a different angle of what's happening. Um, I think this is really cool. There's a lot of really interesting like woe factors that they that the creative team does to try to like keep you guessing as to where things are going to go and um diodo and conifs like they, they put together this art that is extremely grounded it feels like you're reading a james bond book it feels like you're reading a story that is very like real life um because it involves some real reality based things like the war in chechnya right like or the chechnya war right and and things that are happening in russia like in a in 2000 xx time right we don't really know when this takes place but we know that there are some smart computers and smartphones and stuff and there's this air of wondering, like, there is a superpower based kid, but this is called Indigo Children, right? And they keep talking about a single person. Again, there are just drops of hints at, at the bigger world that happen through the book um, that I think are really, really smart. And I, the thing that impressed me the most about this is when the book decides to go like superpowers, it goes... It goes in a really it, it's done in a really smart way, right? It's not just like huge bombastic explosions with like, you know, people with giant things shooting behind themselves, with like tails and stuff. Instead, it's like color schemes and lettering like Hassan um, gets to do some really interesting things with his letter work in order to try to put you into a different reality to, to like show you that something has drastically changed. And it's just in the lettering. And I think that like. It's really impressive what was done. Now, like I said, this this is an ongoing book, so I'm wondering how they're going to take this into a bigger story. But like, maybe this first arc is about the investigator, the journalist, trying to find this one person, and then we're going to see other stories about other indigo children, these kids with powers that we don't really know the definition of. We just know that they have powers. Um, and again, I love all the mystery. I love the uncertainty that this book gives you, while also dropping interesting hints like you're watching a really smartly done mystery movie um so yeah really really digging this first issue i'm excited to see where it goes and i've heard from other people comic shop owners listen to the uh contest of challengers podcast if you listen to that they got some pretty good insight on stuff they said that this book like kicks even more ass as the story goes on so i'm 100 on board really 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 like this book so yeah, it's probably going to be a really cool trade, um, but it reads really well as a single issue. I'll say that. I'm excited to get into it. I, I think yeah. you sold me, Mike. Cool. I mean, and, and, and the people over Image, come on, stop, stop with this Radiant Black Mist Department. I get those books are selling, but that's honestly not, like, in my opinion, not a good like way to sell this book unless the story turns into this bombastic superhero story that that uh, Kyle Higgins is doing. But I have a feeling that it's going to be way more grounded. Um, it, and the Department image, of Truth stuff, like, is there conspiracy in this book? I mean, a little bit. So, mm -hmm. I don't know. I, image is leaving the door open for a crossover for all their properties. So, they oh. just have to <laughs> throw that in there. Dude, if Department of Truth ever crosses over with something, I'm, gonna, I'm never going to buy another Image book in my life. <laughs> um, that series... 
that series is too insane. Like uh-huh. if Spawn shows up in Department yeah. of Truth, I think that's when I that's when I'm but done. I'm ripping up it, the pages that I've got. That would be the perfect conspiracy that there is a Spawn demon running mm-hmm. around like, you know, as a superhero. Danny, I refuse to let Todd McFarlane buy any more baseballs because of I, the money that I gave him, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> Well, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to do the top of our pile. We're going to talk to Kevin a little bit more about things. And uh, I promise I'm going to get on a soapbox about Disney properties at some point. (laughs) Maybe this might be a special Patreon only thing. We'll see. But we'll be back in just a second. It's the second half of episode 368. Welcome back. Hope you had a good break. Hope you liked that Infinity Shred song. Let's talk about comics that are on the top of our pile. Whether they're new, they're old, or just a book you're looking to get off your shelf and you're like, I need to read this. Top of your pile. That's what we're here to talk about. So let's jump right into it. Danny, what is on the top of your pile? Well, Mike, uh, this was a a tough one because I definitely wanted to stay on the license theme. Uh, But I'm going to channel my inner Nick and just (laughs) remind people that 8 Billion Genies and Know Your Station are both coming to an end next week, so make sure to go check those out. But those are not on the top of my pile. Well, they're not on the top of my pile because lucky for me, I've already read both of them to review next week. But at top of my pile is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Usagi, Yojimbo, Where When. And that's not two words. That's all together, Where When. Okay. Uh, from IDW uh, by Stan Sakai. So I'm already in. Uh, yeah, because Tensakai's working on it. Oh yeah. Uh, so in this book, the teenage Ninja Turtles pursue an evil cyber genius, Doctor Werwin, through a time portal and emerge in feudal Japan. There they encounter Yusagi Jojimbo, twenty years into the samurai's future, but decades after the arrival of Doctor Werwin, who has already carved himself a fieldum of using mechanized clockwork samurai robots. Which definitely checks a mark for my like <laughs> inner geek of like samurai robots. Let's go, sure, dude. Uh, dude, I, uh, I I love Stensakai's work. I love the turtles. I love you, Jimbo. Like this was an easy easy pick for me. Yeah. Uh, plus, there was not a lot of Batman coming out this week, so <laughs> it made it even easier. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, okay, hold on. First <laughs> off, like this is not the first TMNT Usagi Yojimbo crossover, right? No, I, sure. as far there's as i know a, i think yeah. this, they, they've there's done more. this before so but I, mm-hmm. this is so exciting right like something about tmnt and yusaji ojimbo like crossing over is so cool to me i don't know it super clicks and i'm glad that there's more coming out like I, I can't wait to read this i didn't even know it was coming out i'm excited to read this this is awesome yeah me too yeah very looking forward to it uh, well, I guess, Paul, what about you? What's on top of your pile? Well, I mean, this is kind of continuing the theme from the last book I talked about, but I was in the shop uh, looking at books and I noticed this was sitting on the shelf. It's a re-release, a reprint of a book that came out back in the mid 90s. It's The Big Guy and Rusty the Boy Robot from Dark Horse Comics. Um, it's written by Frank Miller, art by Jeff Darrow and colors by Dave Stewart. And I remember having this comic when it first came out back in the mid 90s and um it what was it was one of the few comics I regret selling when I sold off my collection and fell fell out of comics for a while because it first off it's Jeff Darrow artwork and the original issues were published on this giant like eleven by seventeen format they were enormous comics super what annoying to store uh, but looked <laughs> yeah. amazing uh, luckily the the Dark Horse just republished it as a trade in the standard comic book size so it's easy to fit on your shelf I'm bearing the lead here because basically this comic is a giant robot fighting kaiju in tokyo drawn by jeff darrow like what more do you want it rules i remember loving it when it first came out i'm excited to go back and revisit go down memory lane the story quote unquote is that um a bunch of scientists in tokyo basically recreate the the primordial ooze to find out how life began on earth and of course what happens it gets out of control and turns into this giant dinosaur that's intelligent and the dinosaur is saying like yeah the world ruled before all you humans showed up we're going to take it back and somehow the dinosaurs like uh blood or dna like turns other people into dinosaurs and then you just get again a giant robot the big guy fighting dinosaurs in tokyo for like i don't know 60 pages all drawn by jeff darrow (laughs) It's a perfect comic awesome? book. I mean, like, like again, I, I can't wait to go back and reread it. I never heard of this, but like, <laughs> I mean, is more Jeff Darrow or Darrow in your life a bad thing? I don't think so. Not right? in my book. No, no, I think it's fantastic. Yeah, 
I will say I've only ever seen Shaolin Co- Cowboy. I've never right. read it, but I've yeah. heard that it's very good. I mean, his his art is unbelievable. I yeah. see. I was looking through his Wikipedia while you were talking. <laughs> he also did a, a one off issue of Aliens. So like Nick, oh. what's up? come on how come you've never told me about this <laughs> but no that looks really cool looks really fun i i see the they re, they're doing the trade paperback collection again so yeah. like yeah. i'd have to grab yeah. a, a copy of this as well polly sold me on this a giant robot <laughs> yeah. so I, I, there's a giant robot and he has a sidekick smaller robot that I, I'm, again yeah. it's rusty of the boy course. robot and the big guy yeah it's super fun and it's frank miller in like goofy weird mode instead of like grim and gritty mode so it's actually kind of yeah. enjoyable and like you know over the top so yeah if you if you like any type of kaiju godzilla type stuff this is exactly the kind of comic that you should be reading so i'm glad cool. it's back in print it's like it's, it looks like astro boy meets iron giant meets godzilla which is there you go i mean like amazing <laughs> things left and right right here yeah that's cool yeah well kevin what about you what's on the top of your pile what are we next all right we're doing licensed properties again me and danny went to the same comic book store I think. please uh teenage ninja turtles again <laughs> yes but, uh the last ronin um so i've never read this i oh, okay. have seen toys i have seen art i have seen everybody talk about this and i was in a comic book store that i go to every so often it's a little further from me and they have this big discount trade bin my favorite place so mm-hmm. <laughs> i found multiple copies of the last ronin and one had a dent in the cover and it was half off so i'm like oh well that's a sign so i picked it up and it's been sitting on my desk and i'm waiting to dive into it Uh, i have not yet it's obviously by eastman and laird and i've just i don't know anything about it all i know is there's one surviving turtle left in some apocalypse wasteland that's all i know so i'm kind of excited that nothing's been spoiled for me and uh, i'm just waiting to just read it (laughs) oh that's uh, you are in for a treat this was on our so we do a thing on our our patreon this past year we did the thing for best of 2022 uh nick picked this book as his best of and i almost fell out of my chair reading this book it's it's i'm a huge turtles fan from like when i was a little kid i've been on and off on the comics and stuff like as an adult this book feels like everything that makes turtles cool like it all encompassed into one Uh, i guess like i don't know what's your history with the turtles i mean obviously i grew uh like you know watched all the cartoons and stuff and i I didn't read a lot of turtle comics i played all the video games oh yeah i watched all the shows i watched the movies um i mean i picked up a turtles comic here or there like some of the originals some of the later things but it never the comics never captured me like like the shows or movies or video games did because I don't know, it was just maybe bad writing or bad art or whatever, but this I've heard so much about. And I just, just, just people like you have to read it. You have nothing else. It's it's like secret. (laughs) It's like a secret club. That's the thing. It's like everybody wants you to read it, but they can't tell you about it because it's the first thing you need to know is the biggest spoiler in the book, which turtle survived. Right. I I don't want to know. (laughs) No. And and I don't want, and I don't want to tell you, right. Like it's, but it's so, good and the way that uh, it's oh it's so good like i can't just can't even talk about it it's just so good cool. well, <laughs> Kevin, Kevin, this, this book is so good that they're making a video game for it oh are yeah. they okay. oh yeah that's how yeah that's how successful this was so and, and they made a sequel series fun. too okay yeah. um, i'm gonna yeah. have to pick that up then when after i read this one but yeah yep cool well I, you know feel free to send me an email after you figure you know read it <laughs> You know, we're always happy to talk about turtles sure. on the show. Um, that's the only property I'll allow, period. Uh, okay. <laughs> anyway, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, all right. Well, let me talk about one more one book that I'm looking forward to. I guess before I do that, I should say we've got some folks hanging out with us on Discord. Nick's here. Hugh's here. Uh, Hugh is reading X-Men 21. Shout out. That was going to be my pick, but I figured yeah, I'm going to talk about something that's not X-Men for once. Um, and Nick is reading Phantom Road number two, which I'm also looking forward to, but um, not as much as Nick. I'll just say that because I... <laughs> I'm going to be sitting down and reading from my huge Fantagraphics haul that I did. I spent too much money on the big Fantagraphics sale that happened recently. Finally got all of my books in. And I picked up this book called Fall Guy for Murder and Other Stories. This is written and drawn by Johnny Craig, plus a few other people, um, edited by Gary Groth. And the reason I bring up the editor is because this, uh, Gary Groth was the person that kind of looked through the history of EC Comics. This is a collection of comics from EC Comics um, and grabbed some of what he considered to be Johnny Craig's best works. I don't know who this guy is. I have no idea about any of the history of EC comics other than like, I know that they're the reason why there was such a slam on comics in the United States back in the fifties and sixties. Right. But this store, this, this collection is, is a series of just like eight or nine page stories, right? It feels very, uh, 
feels very 2000 AD esque um, that cover murder and a mystery and suspense and kind of like tales from the crypt as well as like uh, like supernatural things like suddenly like the first story <laughs> I read a little bit of this already the first story is about a guy and his wife and they're traveling magicians and his wife they wake he wakes up in the morning and his this guy's wife has been turned into a vampire and she has to go feed and he's like okay just like We'll play it on the down low. We'll go to all these small cities and you can just live your life. And eventually he gets sick and he's like, you got to stop killing all these people. And so he tries to keep her in the house and he can't keep her in the house. And then at the end of the book, she turns him into a vampire and then like a witch shows up and she goes, and they were evil. And like, that's the end of the story. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> like, it's, it's very like very one dimensional. Everything's one dimensional. Right. Um, I, but I did read another story in it. That was like this guy, he gets, he gets, uh, he, he gets put up in a, in a hospital and he can't see he's blind. Um, and he knows that as soon as he's no longer blind, they're going to put him in jail. Um, and while he's there, he's, there's another guy who's, who's in the hospital who's next to a window and he's describing to the other patients who can't get up and look out the window. What's outside. And he's like, Oh, and now I see this couple is outside and Oh, they're holding hands. Oh, they've been together for a while. I see them come by every Friday. Um, and, and there's, Oh, look, a bus is driving by and there's a beautiful tree and there's all these birds. And so this guy, you can't see, he, Ask the guy, okay, well, describe all these different things because he's going to make his escape. As soon as he gets his sight back, he's going to lie that he can't see still, but he's going to make his escape out the window. And so he gets this huge description from the man at the window, jumps out the window. It turns out like they're already in the jail <laughs> and he didn't know it. So he can't make his escape. It's like, I don't know, really weird comics. And I was, I saw this as, as part of the fanographic sale and I was like, yeah, let's do it. Let's just buy this thing. Um, so I'm very excited to try out like a different style of comics that I've mm -hmm. really never read before. Like I've never really read any of the EC stuff. And uh, this is, this was touted as some of the better stuff. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm digging into it and we're going to see plus fanographics. If you didn't know makes really, really, really high quality comics. Like their wrappings that they put around all of their books are amazing, right? Like I have that special edition of the love and rocket rockets book that we got Paul, like, yeah. um, the love bunglers. And it's a beautifully like comprised book. And this book mm -hmm. is no different, right? This fall guy for murder and other stories is really beautifully put together. Um, just like, it's nice to hold. It's a perfect size for reading. Like all of the art has been really, really cleaned up. And it's like a great archival book that I'm just happy to have on my shelf. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, try a different style of comic rather than your like 22 page serial or 400 page graphic novel, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, it's very interesting. So looking forward to reading that. Nice. Nice. I always see those collections. and I just never, you know, <clears throat> pull the trigger to buying any of them, but yeah, they look so yeah. lovely put together. Like it is funny that all those comics were made to be disposable. And like, here we are like 60 years later and they get these like, <laughs> yeah. you know, acid free paper, like high quality reprints. But the thing is yeah, like, yeah, yeah. they were disposable, but I've, you know, the, of the EC stuff I've read, the artwork is incredible. Johnny Craig is an amazing artist. And like Jack Dude. Davis did so much work for EC and it's all incredible. Like the people were so talented and like you describe the stories as being kind of like silly or throwaway, but the level of craft being put on the page is amazing. And mm -hmm. It's so great that it's being preserved in that way. You know, so we can right. look at it now. Right. And it's like, I, I think to your point about like the disposability of these stories, it's like, yeah, yeah like the single issues are supposed to be like you read it and you throw it away. <laughs> but like for people that want to have these things like these archives, I think are important to have. It's yeah. not necessarily something that like everybody needs to own. Right. Like you didn't need to keep all of your collections mm -hmm. of of 2000 AD or all of your collections of EC comics or all your collections yeah. of Weekly Shonen Jump. Right. Like that's not the you're not supposed to preserve that piece it's these special editions that you eventually go and buy that like are meant to be the preservation of this. And it's like, like you said, Johnny Craig, incredible talent, you know, like of, of person just like putting together these quote unquote throwaway stories. It's like, I'm yeah. so glad that something's being preserved because like this work needs to be seen for people to take inspiration from so that they can mm -hmm. create more comics to say like, this is what's possible in the medium. Let yeah. me take it a step further. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you know, it's, awesome. it's really cool. Speaking yeah. of creating comics, and taking the medium step further. <laughs> Kevin, you make comic books, don't you? Oh, yeah, I do. <laughs> Is Johnny Craig one of those in, those inspirations for you or, no, or not? No, not really. <laughs> okay, okay. No, I guess like, um, you know, we're here to talk about, you know, what you've been up to and stuff like that. I mean, you reached out to me. You said you've done a bunch of work. You've got this book, Toxic Man, that's out on Global Comics and people can go read. I guess 
how'd you get started making comic books? I mean, you said you're an illustrator and all that stuff, yeah. but like, how'd you get your start? So <laughs> it's been a long road. <laughs> um, sure. <laughs> sure. So yeah, I originally, when I went to college, I was like, I want to draw comic books for a living. I went to school for illustration, you know, I did all that. And then I got out of school and I was like, well, this is way harder than I thought it was going to be. So <laughs> sure, uh, sure. I went to school, back to school for graphic design, got a degree in that. And I've been working as a graphic designer and art director, you know, for my whole career. Um, but I still decided I'm going to still try to do comics. So I did all this, you know, all the samples, I did the top cow talent searches. I did, I even tabled at a couple cons. Like I didn't have any books to push. I'm just sitting there doing sketches. I'm like, I, somebody's sure. got to hire me. You know, I, I, all those things, all those, those talent searches, all the sending of pages. I never, never got anywhere. So, um, I just decided I said, screw it. The the pandemic had just happened. I lost my my job at the time. Mm. And I just said, I'm just going to, I was so anxious because, you know, I have hypochondria. I was like worried about everything. We don't know if we're going to die if we get this, all this yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, I'm just going to, the only thing that calmed me down was drawing. So mm. I just said, screw it. I'm just going to make my own comic. I'm just going to do it. I have my characters. I've been creating the, the characters since I was a teenager. A lot of the characters in my book are the same characters I had from when I was a kid. So sure. like, like Eric Larson did with Savage Dragon, like that was like yeah. kind of an inspiration. <laughs> so I just decided to make it and figure it out from there. I wanted to do the best thing I was told was um, to, when you make a comic, your first or whatever, uh, do everything, do the writing, yeah. do the drawing, okay. do the inking, do the lettering. So I did everything. I, I just mm -hmm. went, went from start to finish. I'm not the best writer in the world. I mean, I had done web comics in the past. I ran a like a, okay. a web comic for about five years because I thought I wanted. I thought that was the way to go. Like you know, do sure. humor comics and stuff like that because I love humorous stuff. Like that's like my kind of thing. I love animation and humor. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, so I got to do that. The logos and stuff. On the other hand, that was a different story uh, because I was working as a graphic designer. Um, uh, my friend Eric Schultz, who's the writer on Deadliest Bouquet and Forgotten Home, she, you know, she had connections and she knew a lot of people who were looking for logos in the comic industry. So she, oh sure, she contacted me. She's like, well, I know a graphic designer. He he's good. He it does work for million dollar companies. Let's let's, you know, <laughs> <laughs> maybe he can do a logo for your book for fun yeah, or yeah. whatever. So the first logo I got was uh, Bingo Love by T. Franklin. Oh. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So I yeah. did that logo and that started me. And so from there, uh, I did Erica's Forgotten Home. I did the Deadliest Bouquet. Mm -hmm. I did uh, the Christabel logo, which is on Kickstarter right now uh, that she's yeah. trying to get funded. I've done Tales of, um, what was it, Tales from the Deep Murky Waters or something from another, uh, other. So other people started to call me and like, hey, you did a logo for this. Let me, I did another logo for a guy who worked at the Kubert School. Um, I don't know if that logo went anywhere, but you know, <laughs> so sure. that's like, I thought of that as my, like, uh, like side, like I can get in the comic industry doing logos, but you know, sure. it just wasn't enough. I wanted to draw, like, that's my passion. I want to draw. I right. want to make characters. I want to do crazy things. So, <laughs> so I figured now I can do both. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Perfect. putting together a whole book by yourself. I mean, it sounds like an endeavor, right? Every single book that we've talked about today has had, you know, a writer and yeah. an artist and an inker <laughs> and a, you know, and a letterer and a graphic designer. And you did it all for this one book. I mean, like what, what's, what's your, what's your process, I guess, for all of that? Did you know how to do all of the no. aspects of this thing or are you learning? Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. So I knew enough about, uh, lettering and uh, logo and, and page layout and stuff like that, just from my, my job, you know? So, but I didn't know really a lot about coloring, uh <laughs> okay you right. know okay. things like that i didn't know how monotonous some of the lettering was because <laughs> like, sure. it, sure. it tends to be like oh yeah the sound effects are cool you do all crazy things but then it's like word balloon after word balloon after word balloon and it's just like oh my god this is so boring <laughs> <laughs> listen we know plenty of letters that are really cool and they absolutely yeah. love it i'm sure <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah i didn't have a process i wrote the th i had a general i did it like the marvel way really you know like with back in the day they like kind of had an idea and mm -hmm. the the artist just went and drew whatever and i plugged in i was literally writing some of the dialogue as i was lettering because the art was mm -hmm. all done and i was sure, still sure. like oh this 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 doesn't sound right let me rewrite this joke or let me do this or i changed sure. a few things so after that um you know i i 
got it all laid out. We got, and then it was like, oh God, where do I go to get this published? <laughs> like, yeah. I had no idea. <laughs> that was the part that I found the most difficult. Nobody knew who I was besides logos. Nobody's going to be like, oh, the logo, are, are the logo designer of this comic has a Kickstarter. Let's yeah, all yeah. flock to that. <laughs> Nobody's <Sure>. coming. <laughs> so... <laughs> I'm like, what's the best, what's the best way? I used to be a big comiXology subscriber. Like I read so sure. much stuff on my iPad and then Amazon squashed, squashed that and made it terrible. <laughs> so then that yeah. global comics was coming out. I'm like, oh, this is, this is upcoming. They're getting like new licenses, like with different companies. I'm like, let me put it on here. Like this seems yeah. like a, the best way to go. And it, they made it so see, so easy. Uh, and nice. it was, it was probably the best way to do it. And I eventually am going to do, uh, printed version um, mm -hmm. and go to some cons this summer. But uh, at first I just wanted to get it out there. I wanted to get it digital and just, just get it out to the public as quick as possible because I've been working on it forever. So, <laughs> Sure. Uh, do you have the quick uh, elevator pitch for the book if you want to, so people yes. know what they're getting into? Yes. So Toxic Man is a washed up middle-aged <laughs> alcoholic <laughs> superhero Love who... It. Uh, whose sidekick dies in an unfortunate accident. Mm -hmm. And he now goes on an adventure with a crazy cast of characters to figure out uh, what happened, why villains are all of a sudden showing up to attack him. And it, that's basically the book. It's like, uh, it's write what you know. So I'm a old <laughs> middle-aged man. <laughs> but, same here. Same know, here. His, his 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 hero days have passed. At the beginning, he had like he was like on TV, he had girlfriend, and then you know the one of the panels in the book is him at a comic con, with like uh, the the price of his autographs just keep going down. It's like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> like yeah. no one no yeah. one cares. It's like one of the old wrestlers at the comic cons. Mm -hmm. Like right. nobody cares. Yeah. You were popular back then. So <laughs> that's it. So it's it's like a redemption story. A lot of the characters in the book, the toxic man is like, it's a, it's his powers. Like he has these toxic powers. Like uh, he can do all these gases and things and he wears like a hazmat suit, but a lot, it's also got a double meaning. Like his personality is toxic. A lot of his yeah. friends' personalities are toxic. They have all these mm -hmm. vices. So it, it's, it's supposed to be a funny book though. It's a lot of tongue in cheek, a lot of parody, a lot of just random characters show up that are parodies of things. Um, sure. Yeah. So it, it's, it pokes a lot of fun at like what happens when Spider-Man becomes 50, 60 years old, you know, kind of thing. It's right. like what happens okay. after, after nobody's got abs anymore because <laughs> no one has abs. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, that's the general gist of the book. It's about 40, almost 48 pages. I put some bios mm -hmm. in the back of the book and some sketches to get it to that point. But, uh, and it, you can see the histories of some of the characters. And my goal is to, you know, uh, do a sequel, um, maybe not as long. I realized making the giant 40 something page book as your first comic was quite the undertaking. So sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> nice. Nice. Is there any, uh, any books that maybe influenced you as a, your style uh, yes. or. Okay. Uh, um, well, my style is very cartoony, uh, my illustrative style. So that, that, that can go from any animation you can see, uh, anywhere. So, but, um, a lot of the, the what I took inspiration from was a lot of the '80s Justice League Keith Giffen okay. stuff. Yeah. Uh, so like the Blue Beetle, like where he's kind of got like a gut, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All that, they're they're dealing with like it's just ridiculous characters, like you mm -hmm. know ridiculous people, and that's what I actually was reading at the time when I was writing a lot of it and trying to get the dialogue down. So sure. it, it's like a lot of sarcasm, a lot of like one-off lines and stuff it's just it's just that kind of the villains aren't the main point it's the funniness and the the the, the his journey to redemption so right okay so that was gotcha. the main thing and i listened to a lot of irish music uh <laughs> when i okay. was drawing it i, I, I was uh, gonna ask i was gonna ask <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of drinking Irish music when I was, uh, you know, right. I had a few Guinnesses myself while I was doing the work. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, there is a there is a fun little Irish drinking song in the middle of it. I I did take a look at it before you know before today. Um, and I the one bit I, I don't want to we don't have to talk about every moment in the plot or anything like that. But one thing that I I thought was really fun was that as the story went on in the bottom right hand corner of every yes. page there is. 
<laughs> there's yeah. more and more like beer cans and wine <laughs> bottles and all this other stuff which like yeah. it's really funny to read like so i'd like downloaded the pdf and i was like reading it on my computer uh-huh. and as i was just like clicking through the pages and stuff i noticed like there was this almost like pile. stop motion thing <laughs> as the <laughs> pile just started getting bigger and bigger and i was like what if like it's such a fun little thing to do and it's 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 rare to see that kind of stuff right. in comics because i know mm-hmm. that like you want to have like this this page layout that's very like serene and kind of clean and stuff but i like that that was showing as the story was going on he was just drinking more and more yeah. and the pile of that was growing i thought that was a fun that's little great. little bit yeah. in the story i like weird comic panel layouts and stuff like that like totally. i the, you know comics are always like that page but i like things in the margins little sketches little weirdo things and crazy panel frames and things like that i always think those are some of the comics that are some of the most intriguing to me because it's not <laughs> just the panel that's interesting it's all the whole book you, know, you got margins you got weird patterns in the, the the margins and sketches and things so yeah i, I love that sort of stuff mm-hmm. yeah i also got a chance to read it um I really enjoyed that. There's, there's, I won't, I won't spoil anything, but there's like a really cool twist that I was like, God, oh, fuck. Wow. I, uh, like, I did I didn't not see it, see it coming at all. I didn't see it coming. Like, I don't know. At no, all. Yeah, it was I didn't really see it fun. At all. Um, and the other thing I was just wondering, like, how did, and, and you already kind of answered this a little bit, like, but how did you have all those character designs in your head? Because just when I thought we had met everyone, someone new yes. popped up on the board. Yeah. Yeah. I was on another podcast and they said the same thing. Like every time I turned a page, this crazy character showed up. They're like, well, how many more can you shove in here? I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I just, I like creating characters. I like, mm-hmm. I like, I kept, I have this like Manila folder in my um, stuff that's just all these characters that I just drew throughout the years and just like as a teen, as a teenager. And I, what I do is I pull them out. I'm like, this design looks okay. And I rewrite the whole thing. Cause when I first started these, some of these characters, um, besides the parodies, a lot of them came later, but toxic man himself I made when I was like 16. Uh, he was like, you know, like, real superhero it was like supposed to be serious but now i was like no all this has to change (laughs) but the designs are still there so i keep like this like slush file of characters that i can just pull out (laughs) that's cool like the little there was was one part there's a little devil girl in it and i had her i wrote a children's book story and she was the star of the children's book store. I never published it or anything. It's still sitting. I never finished it. <laughs> but like I do that. I like had the slush. I'm like, oh, my God, this character works for this. You know, so. Nice. I, I also got to ask, as somebody that works with a lot of logos, and now that you've done some lettering, what what is your favorite sound effect in a comic page? Oh, my God. So that's <laughs> there's this old Avengers comic. I can't remember. And Thor did, you know, lifted his hammer up and the lightning came down and it was crack a thum and it went across the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's the best sound effect I ever saw. And I showed it to my friend and he laughed and laughed and laughed. And then he made fun of me for the next 12 hours because he thought it was the most ridiculous sound effect he ever saw. So I still remember that one so vividly. And every time I see a Thor comic and it shows up I'm like there it is. So that's the one yeah. I remember the most. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's a that that sound effect is also a big part of Invincible. If you've ever yes, read that, I have the whole series. Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, I love Invincible for all of its flaws and stuff. But I do. I always will appreciate the sound effects in that book because they I think Kirkman, as he did that book, got more and more absurd with it. Yes. And like it totally embraced it. And it became like a almost like a selling point for me to tell people yeah. about. I'm like, and you'll have no idea. These crack of thooms <laughs> will just blow your mind. Yeah. <laughs> that one's probably one of the b- biggest answers. Uh, my other favorite is when there's like a machine gun and there's like a crack a taka taka taka. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Punisher always has those in the yeah. yeah. You know, I never actually like even being a designer, when you read a lot of comics, I don't pay that much attention to the sound effects a lot. Like in sure. the lettering. And now that I've done a lot of like I did it, like it it's it's so much i pay way more attention than i ever did before so sure. that's kind of it was a neat little thing that came out of it. it made me enjoy certain parts of comics that i really didn't like look at that much i mean the best part the best lettering is you don't notice it because if right. it's done wrong it looks terrible but <laughs> right but yeah I, I appreciate that so much more now so <laughs> yeah yeah well i mean that's the thing like you said this is your, so your first book doing everything um that's the that is impressive to extremely impressive to me not just because one one man band folks are like totally impressive in general but like 
I've we've read plenty of books i think as comic <laughs> readers where like the lettering is just awful like nick yeah, and i yeah. in specific like our, our buddy nick we've there was one book that we read that was a, it was a while ago it was a crime comic or something and just the lettering was just abysmal and this is by like big name creator like we were just like wow how did this get published you know and it's i guess it's fine it's fine so like the fact that you're saying like you know you I, what i'm trying to say you did an inc- incredible job having this <laughs> been like your first time <laughs> yeah. um because i know that there's a lot of pitfalls that people fall yes. into when it comes to lettering right like putting whole mm-hmm. paragraphs inside of oh, one yeah, bubble yeah. and like mm-hmm. running things too close to the law edge of the lines and stuff like that and i'll say yeah. like as a very well experienced comic book reader, I noticed none of that in the book. So, like, perfect. Hats off to you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I also had a, a you know, because of my friend Erica, she, I had her take a look before. I'm like, all right, take a look at okay. this before I put it out, just to be sure I'm not screwing anything up. You're the experienced right. one. I'm not, but you know, just just take a peek. But she gave me the good, the, the good thumbs up. So <laughs> that's awesome. That's very awesome. Cool. That's awesome. I, I had one more thing that I wanted because because there you're, there's so many varied like uh, uh, characters in your book. I wanted to ask if there's a specific comic where it kind of clicked in your head like, oh, this is the medium I want to work in. Like, I know you mentioned that was kind of your plan going into school. Yeah. But like, was there a comic or an issue or a run maybe that you're like, oh, I want to do this? It was X-Men. I was a huge yes. X-Men fan back in the day. I mean, I still am. But sure. uh once I got from G.I. Joe, like where I started, I'm like, oh, like, and then I discovered X-Men on the newsstand and I picked it up. It was Jim Lee stuff, too. Um, so cool. I picked it up right then at the beginning. And I'm like, what is this? You know, I didn't really know anything about the characters. I was still buying G.I. Joe and Transformers, you know. So right. and then I was like this ma- this amazing team of all these characters. And that's what really and I bought those th- uh, x-men x-factor like i bought those for years so i loved hmm. and you know x-force and all that stuff when they just started making random characters show up and all these people i was like there's so much stuff you can do and that's mm-hmm. that's what i thought i was gonna do <laughs> which i kind of did i mean i made a book where i could make as many stupid characters as i want <laughs> Right, right, right. But what I, what I'm hearing from this pattern is that you love various large team books, yeah. right? Like <laughs> X Men, GI Joe, Transformers. Yeah. The more characters you can jam into a book, the better, I right? Love it. Yeah, I, love I totally get different that. Different things. I love like teams with like specialties, and you can pick and choose. Like, uh, all right, we need a team to go here. Let's get all the mountain climbing guys and go there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I love I love that stuff. I don't know. It's just, maybe it's because I'm a big toy collector and it just sells tons of toys, and that's. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess that's the goal then. At some point, there's got to be a Toxic Man action figure, oh, right? Action I would figure. die if that happened. I mean, that, right. That's a goal. That's, that's a great goal. I want yeah. my yeah. second, my earliest goal is to get just another book out there. <laughs> sure, so, sure. Yeah. But okay. yeah, that's hopefully maybe down the line someday. Yeah. No, Why hey, not? you know, anything's possible with Kickstarter these days. You know, That's there's true. a Dave Baker we had on the show a while back. He did a book with Alex Zerit, I think. Um, and they, it, it's a cyberpunk, blah, 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 blah. They have one like character. And as part of their Kickstarter, they had uh, like a limited run of like a hundred action nice. figures that they made. Mm-hmm. So, like, mm-hmm. there are connections out there. People know that there are wants and needs. And who knows? Anybody can buy a 3D printer these days. That's true. So, That's true. like. <laughs> I'll get there. Uh, I mean, I, yeah. I didn't want to tackle the Kickstarter yet, but uh, sure, sure. <laughs> I will eventually. I want to put it. I think I think I want to put out another book or two and then sure. maybe go to some more cons, not table yeah. and just, you know, do the networking, sure. talking thing and then and totally. then get to that Kickstarter point. I don't think I'm there yet, but I will be. What what uh, what cons are you thinking about hitting this summer? Uh, probably just New England stuff. Uh, usually I like to go to the Hartford uh, one, Hartford Comic Con. I go to the Mohegan Sun it's in it's in Connecticut too, and then I live near Springfield, uh, Massachusetts, so I can go to that. Um, and maybe there's a couple in Boston, but I'm wary on that one. Uh, you know, they're so big and so crowded; it's just it's oh, sure. a little overwhelming. Like it's like trying to talk to people, and there's like a million people. Like I like the smaller ones right off the start. With I think I think because I've been to New York, I've I've tried mm-hmm. to do those things with yeah, New yeah. York for years, trying to like show my portfolio. Like I I think I, I like at the portfolio review, standing in line, and then they're like, yeah, this is great. Here's a business card, and you know, you never hear anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. I've done those, and I think the 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 where I've gotten the most success, and I think any comic creator starting the most success is the smaller ones because you can start oh, totally. talking to people and make a network of people and i think that's that's what i've been doing and and that seems to be the best even a network of like podcasters and things like that just ha- meeting people and being friendly it, it seems to work the best so 
Yeah, th- those small cons are where like the intimate actual like conversations yeah. can happen where you're like you don't necessarily feel bad talking to someone for 30 minutes because there's not like <laughs> yeah, necessarily a line around people. the corner. Um, yeah, totally get that. Totally get that. Uh, well, Paul, Danny, any any last questions, I guess, before we wrap up here? No, I think I got everything in, but I really, really enjoyed the book. So I think, yeah. Well, thank you. I yeah. appreciate it. Uh, yeah. I, I, I Hopefully I'll print one soon, but. <laughs> no. well, reg- either way, folks can always check them out. You know, we've got a link in the show notes and stuff. Oh, like, go ahead, Paul. No, I think it's great. I think uh, it, you, you're doing it and it's really encouraging to see somebody just kind of like guy f- all in and have a workout. Yeah. So yeah, great work. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Yeah, so don't forget to check out Toxic Man on Global Comics. We'll have a link in the show notes, like I said. I guess, Kevin, where can folks find you on the internet if they want to say, like, this is the best comic book I've ever read, or, or maybe just ask you questions about going from logos to lettering yeah. to whatever? All right, uh, so I usually hang out on Twitter and Instagram. Um, it's any kind of social network. My name is uh, K- KM Comics and Toys, so that's where I usually am. And I have my own website at kevinmahardesign.com. So that's where you can send me messages about logos if you're looking to have a logo done for your comic. Uh, yeah, so I'm over there. And I think that's it. I think those are the main social networks I'm on. So, Okay, cool. We'll make sure to get links for those and put them all in the show notes and stuff. But um, this is a blast. Kevin, thank you so much for coming on the Thanks show and reaching me. out to us and stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, really enjoyed the comic. And like I said, everyone check it out on Global Comics. You can get it. It's two ninety nine, dollars I think, for the PDF, or you can read it on their website, which yep. is really, really like exactly how much a comic book should cost, yes. I guess, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> right? Um, but uh, we are... We're here to draw the line at 2.99 or something. That's I don't right. know. We, we're, anyways, let's wrap up here before I again. I'm ready to just get on this soapbox, everybody. I'm just ready. Okay. Um, so next week's episode is going to be me and Nick and Paloma. We're going to be chatting with Chris Solis, who's got a Kickstarter right now for a Flag to Fly. Look forward to that. The book looks beautiful. Um, we'll talk about more of that next week. As always, you can check us out on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Discord. We got a Goodreads. We've got a YouTube channel that Danny's been running, and it's been fantastic. Um, we put all of our ridiculous shtick, um, you know, and bits that I'm screaming and yelling um on there it's it's pretty fun uh you can support us on patreon and get access to the ircb movie club which is coming out very soon we have a a locked in pick for that i'm gonna i'm gonna wait till may to to announce what that is but this month for april we're gonna be dropping the first of maybe many episodes of a series called mike's x-men blind box where i grab a random x-men comic and then just kind of throw people into it and see if they understood it at all (laughs) um so that's that's gonna be really fun it's dropping at the end of this month so make sure to support us at patreon.com slash ircb podcast to get access to that plus like over 150 previous episodes that are only on patreon of different things infinity shred is the best band in the universe they do all of our music xander is with you always he believes in you all of you and i would say thank you to kevin for joining us thank you to paul and danny for being on this episode thank you to nick for proof listening and until next time comics are good and so are you